Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening for our second fall uh, 2022 landscape workshop. Uh, my name is Giselle, I'm a water use efficiency specialist with Alameda County Water District. Um, and this workshop is offered um, in partnership with our agency and the um, Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. And so today's uh, workshop will be about um, capturing uh, rainfall and uh, different ways for doing that. So we hope that you'll find this informative and helpful. Next slide, please. Yeah, so first I'll just uh, start off by just providing basic Zoom logistics. Um, everyone will be muted by default, but we do encourage you to ask your questions. So if you could please go ahead and type up your questions as they come up in the Q&A uh, chat box. We'll uh, be reading through them, monitoring it, and um, trying to uh, answer them throughout the presentation. Um, but we will also have a Q&A uh, section at the end of the workshop. So you can also ask your questions then as well. Next slide, please. Um, so first, I just wanted to uh, provide some information about um, the district's drought actions and our water use restrictions. So as uh, some of you may know, um, ACWD declared a water shortage emergency back in December 2021, and we adopted uh, water use regulations, restrictions, and guidelines. And these restrictions aim to um, conserve the district's water supply by minimizing landscape irrigation while maintaining landscape viability, minimizing water waste, and restricting other non-essential uses. And so on the screen here in these graphics, you'll see um, a number of different um, outdoor water use actions that are prohibited by the um, ordinance. And those include runoff from irrigation, using decorative fountains, using hoses without uh, positive shutoff nozzles, and hosing off hardscapes like sidewalks and driveways. And our ordinance is really aimed at um, outdoor water use. Next slide, please. So one of the key provisions of our ordinance is uh, limiting the number of days per week that um, lawns can be irrigated with sprinklers. And so as of October 1st, our um, irrigation restriction is one day per week. And here on the screen, you can see um, the irrigation schedule for um, all the different months of the year. So as mentioned, during October, um, customers are limited to irrigating their lawn with sprinklers to no more than one day per week. And that'll decrease to one day every other week in November and December. And you can find um, more information about our ordinance, a copy of the ordinance um, at our website here at, at the link on the screen, acwd.org forward slash WSE ordinance. Next slide, please. So now I'll just provide uh, some more information about Alameda County Water District. So it's the mission of Alameda County Water District to provide a reliable supply of high quality water at a reasonable price to our customers. Next slide. The district was founded uh, back in 1914. So we have over a hundred years of providing service to the cities of Fremont, New York and Union City. We serve about 357,000 customers and have over 84,000 connections. And we have a, a diverse water supply portfolio. As you see on the screen, um, we get 40% uh, of our water from our local Alameda Creek watershed and 40% um, imported from the state water project and 20% imported from the San Francisco uh, Public Utilities Commission hedge hedgey system. So now I wanted to highlight um, just some of the different water conservation programs and uh, resources that we offer our customers. So for residential customers, we have a number of different um, rebates and, and programs. Those include our free water conservation kits that you can order um, and receive uh, one free low flow shower head, faucet aerators for the bathroom and kitchen and toilet leak detection diet tablets. We also have our turf replacement rebate uh, we are offering $2 per square foot of lawn that you remove and replace with water efficient landscape up to a um, $3,000 max rebate for uh, residential customers. We also offer our landscape workshop series um, and we have uh, irrigation hardware rebates as well where you can receive a rebate um, for purchasing high efficiency sprinklers um, and uh, rotors. Next slide, please. So one of the uh, programs that I wanted to highlight that was relevant to today's workshop is our Rain Barrel Rebate Program. So for this rebate, you can apply online uh, via the Droplet platform at the Bosco website, and you can reach that application by visiting our rebates page at acwd.org forward slash rebates. 
Our rebate is up to $50 per rain barrel for a maximum of two rain barrels. So you can receive a maximum $100 rebate. And the application um, asks for photos of the rain barrel that's installed in your home, a receipt for the rain barrels that you purchased that um, has the price of the barrel, um, how many barrels you purchased and how many gallons the barrel is, and just basic information like your name and ACWD account number. And um, here are some details, more specific uh, requirements from the rebate. Uh, barrels must be at least 50 gallons in order to qualify. And we do have a number of different resources on our website and on the Bosco website, such as safe practices um, and installation and maintenance, maintenance guidelines for how to design your um, system and how to keep your water clean. And uh, as part of the program, we do emphasize proper setup for the rain barrel. So having some sort of uh, mesh screening or sealed design to control against like mosquitoes and debris um, connected to a rain gutter downspout or other effective means to capture flow from roofs and other impervious surfaces. The barrel should be placed on a solid level foundation to minimize risk that will fall over and not be blocking any pathways or, or walkways for safety. So uh, now I just want to provide uh, some information about Bosca, uh, who we're partnering, partnering with to date for this workshop. So Bosca represents 26 agencies that include cities, water districts, um, and a university that purchased water wholesale from the San Francisco Regional System. Bosca member agencies provide water to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses and community organizations in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties. And Bosco's goal is to provide a high quality supply of water at a fair price. And uh, today's workshop's objectives uh, really relate to outdoor water use, which represents a really huge opportunity for water conservation in our service area. Um, and we wanted to provide today's workshop as a as to provide information about one of the ways that you can um, have efficient outdoor water use through the use of you know, innovative techniques like, techniques like uh, capturing rainfall. And here are some other um, upcoming uh, Bosco webinars that you may be interested in and attending. Um, there are some on lawn conversion and uh, drought tolerant habitat gardens coming up. So if you're interested, um, you can sign up at bayareaconservation.org. Just a quick disclaimer, uh, this presentation is general in nature and not intended to be an exhaustive review of the subject matter. The information contained in this presentation does not necessarily reflect the policies of ACWD, Bosco, or its member agencies, and the presentation, instructor information, and materials provided are provided as a courtesy to participants and are not endorsed by ACWD, Bosco, or its other member agencies. And if you have any questions about ACWD's uh, drought restrictions or water conservation programs or resources, um, please feel free to um, give us a call or shoot us an email and we'll be happy to answer, uh, answer your questions and help you out as best as we can. If you have any right now, you can also feel free to put them in the chat um, Q&A box and I'll uh, try to answer them as we go through the presentation. And now without further ado, um, I'll introduce our wonderful instructor for this evening, Chris Corvetti. After graduating from St. Lawrence University with a degree in mathematics and environmental science, Chris worked as an environmental educator until joining the Peace Corps. She first experienced drought conditions during her two year service in Mongolia. Upon completion of her service, Chris moved to California as a member of the Watershed Stewards AmeriCorps program, where she delved into issues surrounding water conservation specific to the Bay Area. Since the end of her AmeriCorps service in 2017, Chris has worked with numerous local nonprofits and municipalities to install rainwater harvesting systems throughout the Bay Area. So Chris, uh, thank you so much for being our instructor for this workshop this evening, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you, Giselle. So I guess I'm gonna start with the biggest question of why. <laughs> so why should we harvest rainwater? Um, I recently had someone actually ask me this question. They went on to say that their water bill has always been reasonably low, so why should they make the change? So this is a great question to start on. Why? Besides all of the obvious and wonderful answers listed on this screen, let's think about the water we use. To drink, cook, shower, clean, flush toilets, water plants, wash pets, do laundry. These are just a few of the ways that we use water every single day. 
Now think about where your water comes from. Giselle outlined where the Alameda County water comes from in the beginning. And 20% of that was from Hetch Hetchy. Now that water actually takes about eight days to get to us. I'm not talking about the water cycle and the time for a raindrop to be formed. I'm talking about the actual time it takes to travel through pipes from Yosemite Valley to get to us. We did also mention that 40% comes from our local watershed. And rainwater harvesting is a great way to boost the health of our watershed and replenish groundwater. It can also help with reducing saltwater intrusion, which is one of the biggest factors affecting our wonderful water basin. So we know why, but is there actually enough rain to make this viable in this area? We are in a drought, we don't get much rain. So let's look at some numbers first. A thousand square foot, foot roof can capture over 600 gallons of rainwater in one inch of rain. So here's a handy dandy equation that you can take to figure out how much water your roof can capture, or I can make it a little bit easier for you and say that we probably wouldn't be having this webinar if there wasn't enough water. So there is. So let's take a look at some more numbers. A thousand square foot roof and a half inch of rain, which is about the average event of rain that we get here, can capture about 310 gallons. But Alameda County gets 22 inches of rain a year. That's not a ton of rain. The national average is 38 inches. But 22 inches is significant when you think about that 1,000 square foot roof capturing over 13,000 gallons of water. That's a huge amount of water. It's almost too much water to imagine coming off the roof of our homes. But think about all the water that starts flowing down the sides of the roads or flooding our highways, even when the rain's barely starting to rain. We already will see just trickles of water and then just rapidly flowing water down our streets. And when it rains, all that water hits the impervious surfaces. It cannot infiltrate into the ground. Instead, it flows down our streets, picking up pollutants as it goes. And some of those pollutants include these examples here. Oil used from restaurants, concrete and building supplies from construction sites, oil and brake dust from cars, ash from forest fires, pet waste, soaps from cleaning vehicles or other outdoor areas, trash, litter, pesticides, herbicides. And all of that pollution goes into our storm drains. It all gets picked up by that flush of that first rainfall and all that rainwater that's running down our impervious streets and it gets carried into our storm drains. So where do our storm drains go? So for those of you that don't know, storm drains are the grates that you see on the sides of roads. They're often labeled with a label such as no dumping, flows to bay, flows to creek, flows to ocean. This is because the water in a storm drain does not get treated like wastewater from inside our home. As you can see in this image, household wastewater goes to a wastewater treatment plant. And we're gonna see if I can get this to draw. So from our household water, it flows down into the water treatment plant and then it gets treated and it's nice and clean. It comes out for purple pipe irrigation or gets filtered into the ground or the bay and it comes out nice and clean. Unfortunately, storm drain water does not go to a treatment plant. So the storm drain dumps the water directly into the nearest natural waterway without any treatment. So rainwater harvesting can help prevent this added pollution from entering our creeks by a process called slow it, spread it, and sink it. Slow it, spread it, sink it refers to a slowing our storm water down, spreading it out, so that it has a chance to sink into the ground to nourish our plants and refill our aquifer. The more water that we can prevent from running over our man-made hardscape, the healthier our local creeks and ecosystem will be, and the more water we'll have in our natural system to be able to draw from for municipal use as well. So let's talk about a few different types of rainwater harvesting that can help us to slow it, spread it, and sink it. 
So I'm going to talk about rain barrels and cisterns predominantly today. It's going to be the main topic of our discussion, but I want to briefly touch on pervious pavement and rain gardens. If you guys have questions as I'm going along, just type them into the Q&A and I'll pause at the end of each slide to answer the ones pertaining to this section. So pervious pavement. As you can see in these images, there are a few different types. The basic how it works is on the bottom left, you have one of these types of permeous pavement on the top and underneath that you have the bedding and the base and the sub base that are going to help that water to soak into the ground. Our local soil gets very hard and cracked in between rainfalls and it does not like to soak in the water right away. So putting in a nice base allows that water to soak into the ground more thoroughly and much faster so we don't have flooding in the areas where we install this pervious pavement. It, we want it to be a solution, not create other problems. So there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can just allow spacing between non-perbial pavement, as you can see in this upper picture on the left. Or in these two pictures on the right, you can see porous cement. So that can be poured as a slab or purchased as pavers. So if you're doing it for your house, um, just for a walkway or something small, you'll probably just purchase the pavers. But if you're having your driveway refinish, um, actually having it poured is a, a great option. As you can see here on the right hand upper picture, all of the parking spots in this picture are permeable asphalt, but the actual roadway is not. The whole design is designed so water will drain into the parking spots and sink into the local soil. But because it's a heavily used parking, a heavily used parking lot, and people drive a lot through the system, they use regular asphalt for the main area of the driving. But the parking spaces can be pervious pavement because it's great for that. A lot of local walkways also do it. And one of our um, participants did recognize that this is Mitchell Park Library in Palo Alto um, because that was the best picture I was able to grab when I was roaming around. Um, it is also used in some of the county parks as the natural walkways. Um, I don't have a good picture of this though. Um, so we're gonna move on to rain gardens. And rain gardens are, again, a great way to slow it, spread it, and sink it. Um, the way that they work, we're going to kind of talk about in the next slide when we look at the anatomy. But the main thing is you don't need as much irrigation because you have a system that's set up, especially with native plants, to provide habitat and really soak in the natural rain that we get and just be healthy all year without having much watering. Um, they're going to reduce flooding, sewer overflows, and erosion because you're gathering the water in one location, temporarily ponding it in spot, and then sinking it into the ground. Uh, with native plants, you really don't have much maintenance. Um, there are rebates available for rain gardens. Check out those specific qualifications and plants that are required to qualify for a rain garden rebate on the websites. And we'll give you a list of the websites at the end of the program. So the anatomy is the, you know, the nitty gritty, the interesting part. And this is a traditional rain garden. There are other options and there may be ways to get the rebate without having it exactly like this. But the main traditional anatomy of a rain garden is to have three main layers. So you dig it out and then you put in the very bottom drainage rock. And you want about three to six inches of drainage rock, or sometimes even more. If you're filling in a large area, you may want more, or if you have a lot of water that you need to capture, you can do some, some wonderful equations to figure out how big your garden's gonna need to be to capture a large amount of rainfall. Um, but in the bottom, you're gonna put your drainage rock. And then on top of that, you're gonna use bioswale soil, soil. So you can buy already made bioswale soil. You can also make your own by mixing your natural soil, sand, and compost to create a soil that is not going to bind up. It's not going to have too much clay in it, and it's going to want to let the water to soak through. On the top, you want larger rocks. So I call them river rocks. They can be anything larger to hold that soil in place so your soil doesn't float away. 
and just to add the aesthetic look that you're looking for. So you can use river rocks, lava rocks, whatever really appeals to you, but something larger to hold things in place. On the sides of your bioswale, you're gonna have these raised berms and you wanna mulch those just to keep the moisture in. You want that moisture to stay in the soil. So when the during the rain, rain event, you're gonna have temporary ponding. So the swale will kind of fill up with the water but because we have this bioswale soil and this drainage rock, the whole system is going to be able to soak that water in. So each layer is going to be anywhere from three to six or a little bit more inches. So we're looking at anywhere from, you know, nine to 18 inches deep with pretty much the minimum being nine. You may want to go deeper or shallower depending on what your watershed is. So that equation we looked at earlier for how much rain is going to come off of your downspout is the equation you're going to use to figure out how much you need to, how much area you need to be able to absorb water into so that you're not flooding outside of your bioswale that you're creating. Uh, another great way to connect the rain, rain gardens to a rain barrel is to actually capture your water from your downspout into a rain barrel and then run your overflow into the rain garden. So we are going to head on over and talk about rain barrels and cisterns and see how that works and what I mean by the word overflow. So rain barrels and cisterns essentially hold that water, they capture it, they hold it in place and you're storing it for later use. And that means when it's not raining, you have water to irrigate with without using municipal water. So it has all these wonderful things that we've already discussed. And let's get right on into the anatomy. So at the top, see if I can pick a color other than red since I already have red on here. Um, we'll see if neon green will show up on the screen. Um, oops, it's one way to make it show up. Okay, so neon green, we're gonna follow our water at the top. So the water comes in at the very top and that's a downspout from a roof gutter. And then it's hitting with, this is a leaf eater here. And it's hitting that leaf eater, which you can see blown up on the left-hand side of the screen. And the leaf eater is a mesh screening that just is easy to clean. And we'll talk about them a little bit later. But the main thing to note is that the first thing on your system is screening. Because we already talked about it, we don't want mosquitoes in these systems. So we wanna have screening first. And in this system, there's actually screening at the leaf eater, and then there's screening below it at the next point um, at the barrel itself. So then we have the tank or the holding part of the barrel. And the next thing we have on top here is our depth gauge. And it's really tiny in this picture, but we blew it up on the right hand side. This is an optional accessory. We'll talk about it later on. You can decide if that's something you want or you don't want. You don't need it. You do need the screening, but you don't necessarily need the depth gauge. Um, and that just tells you the percentage that's left in your tank. Um, your overflow, which as you can see here is in the top right with a zoomed in on the middle left, is where once your tank is totally full, all the extra water needs a place to escape. We don't want it coming back out the top of our tank because that'll be very messy. It'll go everywhere. We want to have it controlled. We want to have it leading somewhere and we want it on our property. So we'll talk, talk about that a little bit more too on the next slide. Then you can see in this picture, there's straps. And this is installed at Gamble Garden in Palo Alto. So what you really want to think about is how big is the tank? How tall is the tank? Where am I putting it? Do I need to strap it? Do I need to earthquake proof it? Or do I feel like you know it's kind of behind my house where no one can get to? It's not a safety issue to be strapped. So that is an optional um, decision for you as well to make based on your own situation for your house, because this is a public installation at a public public garden. It is strapped for earthquake proofing and child proofing. 
Um, at the output, there are different ways that you can run the output and we're gonna discuss those. In the top picture, you can see it's running out to a hose to be watered with a hose. And in the bottom picture, you can see that we are running to two different timers for drip irrigation. So we're gonna delve into all of these different parts of the system now and take a look at how they can go into different size tanks and different cisterns. This cistern pictured here is a 265 gallon slimline, but the basic anatomy is the same for a 50 gallon tank or a 500 gallon tank, because we have these same parts that we're gonna look at. So we're gonna look at the inflow and the overflow first. And the reason I have these together, even though they're different parts, is because there is a partial diverter, which is in this bottom picture. And you can see that this actually acts as both the inflow and the overflow. So the upper picture, the water flows straight into the top of the tank, just like we saw in our last image. And we can't see it, but I guarantee you that there is screening right here. And that screening is keeping the mosquitoes out because it is required by the state of California, required by your county, and just good old common sense because we don't want to breed mosquitoes in our own backyard. Um, so we do have the screening. And as you can see with this partial diverter, it's a little bit of a funky system, but the water flows in from your downspout here. And then it fills up this, oh, let me try that again. That's funny, I did that completely backwards. So your water flows down your downspout in the normal way that water flows, which is downhill. So the water's coming in your downspout, it goes into this little rubber gasket and flows into your tank. And now the arrow that I drew it a little bit too early is actually your overflow. So once your tank is totally flow full, it will flow back out the same way and it will fill up this little rubber gasket and go over and then back down the center of your downspout. So with the first style where you divert the entire system, you would also need to drill a hole high up on the tank somewhere in this region to install an overflow. But with the second system with the partial diverter, you don't need to drill an extra hole in your tank because the one hole going in and out will work as your inflow and your overflow. In this case, your screening goes right here. You want your screening right where the water is starting to come in. Um, so I'm gonna erase that ink so you can actually see the images. Um, if you are, running an overflow from a full divert system and not back into your existing downspout. It has to drain on your property. You can't flood your neighbor. And so the best way to do that is connect it to a garden or a swale or somewhere that you have room. And in general, you need to be at least three feet away from your property line so that we make sure that all that water flows in to your own property and we're not flooding a neighbor no matter how much you don't love your neighbor um, or you really wanted a new fence, you can't flood out the foundation of your fence. Uh, we wanna have mesh or screening on both the inflow and the overflow. So for a tank where those are separate, you do need to make sure that they're both screened. But if you're doing this partial diverter, like the bottom picture, one screen will cover both. Um, so let's talk a little bit about output and how we're going to use that water now that we've covered inflow and overflow, unless we have any questions specific to inflow or overflow. I think I have uh, one question um, from Bob who says, so the pressure from the stationary water in the barrel is sufficient to have the drip system work. Well, that is an excellent segue into output because a drip system is going to be part of the output of the barrel. So let's talk about output and we'll get to that question. Um, so output, how do you want to use your water? Do you want to, like Bob, use a drip irrigation system? And if you're using a drip irrigation system, do you want to put it on a timer like this upper right hand picture? 
or do you want to go out there and turn it on manually when you think your plants need a little drink of water? Um, some gardeners like to be very hands-on and some prefer to not have to worry about it. So those are different ways that you can think about it. Um, there are timers that are made for these drip systems. If you are just using the pressure from the water in your tank, you need to make sure that your drip irrigation system that you install is all gravity fed irrigation systems. These are different than the standard irrigation you would hook on to a regular hose bib in your backyard or to your municipal water supply. Your municipal water supply has a pressurized system. Your rain barrel tank only has the amount of pressure of gravity on the amount of water in the barrel. So if you have a 55 gallon tank, you're not gonna water 100 plants. You're gonna water about 20 plants. If you have a 55 gallon tank, you're probably not gonna be able to water 20 plants for the four or five months of the year where we get absolutely no rain just from the rainfall because you need to think about sizing your system to that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about sizing your system on the next slide. Um, so for drip irrigation, you do need to have an extra filter, which you can see in both of these pictures on the right. This is your filter here. This is the filter there. And that's an extra fine filter just to keep your drip system from clogging. Because you're going to get some pollen in your tanks, you're going to get some debris in your tanks, even if you use extra things like a first flush system or extra leaf um, filters like we're going to talk about a little bit later. You're, if you want to use drip irrigation, you're going to need to put another filter on. The good news is most gravity fed drip irrigation system kits come with a filter. So it's an all in one, about $50 from your local hardware store, all in one kit to water up to about a hundred plants. Um, for hose watering, you also wanna think about if you are just gonna use gravity to do that, in which case you're not gonna be able to water anything that is higher than the level of water in your barrel because water flows downhill, not uphill. So you wanna, you wanna be able to think about where you're watering and where your tank is. Um, but if you're going to use watering cans, you'll be able to fill those cans and move them. So we will talk a little bit about pumps and when you might want to pump later. Um, and you may just want to capture this water so that we can fill up the local aquifer and you're just going to drain it into a landscaped swale or dry creek bed and let it sink into the ground and you're not actually hoping to water anything, in which case your system should be very easy to set up. Um, do we have any more questions just about output? Um, so I do see, I'm just going to quickly address this before I move on. I've got a couple questions here asking if the slides are going to be available. The entire presentation with my lovely voice as the backdrop will be on the Bosco website, um, posted up probably within a week. And so you'll be able to do that. We won't be emailing it to you, but it will be available on the website. There are also previous ones from myself and other presenters that cover this information and slightly different information gauged towards using it specifically for a rain garden or using rain barrels specifically for other desires on the Bosco website. So you can definitely check those out as well. Um, but if you have specific questions, it's a great opportunity to be able to ask them while I'm presenting. Um, okay, so we are going to move on to how to choose your system. So we talked a little bit about things that you'd want to consider, right? You want to think about where your system is. You want to think about your roof size. We talked about harvesting potential. I gave you guys that excellent equation, which we can look at again later um, at the uh, during the Q&A if you didn't get a chance to write it down. So you can calculate what your harvesting potential is for your entire house or per each downspout. And you want to think about how many downspouts you have in the house. You know, maybe go out during the next rainstorm and see which downspouts are flowing the most heavily or look at the erosion you have under your downspouts to see which ones ha um, have the most water coming out. And then think about the space. Do you have enough room for a barrel? We don't want to block walkways. We want to make sure that we're keeping paths clear. Is there room for a barrel? How big of a barrel can you put there? And what is your ground, right? What's underneath this barrel? 
because you can't put the barrel on mulch. It's going to degrade and your barrel is going to be lopsided and filled with water, which weighs over eight pounds a gallon. So it's going to be really heavy. So you want that barrel to be nice and level and on a very sturdy ground. So you can dig down to dirt and you can build up a wooden frame with rocks and fill it in. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you a picture of that in the next slide. Or if you're lucky enough to already have a concrete pad there, you can set the barrels on that. I have a picture of that on the next slide as well. Um, but you, there are ways to build up a base and fill it with gravel and make it nice and sturdy so that you have a nice solid base for your barrel. Um, think about where you're gonna use the water and where you're gonna use your overflow. Right, if you want your overflow to go into a garden, you probably don't want your barrel on the opposite side of the house from that garden. So you want to just think about where you're gonna use that water and how you're gonna use that water and where you're gonna want it to overflow. And you want the tank to be reasonably close to your downspout you're capturing from and to the garden that you're gonna be watering with it. Um, you're probably gonna to wanna to think about aesthetics. If you're an artist like the person who painted this barrel, you're all set. You can make any barrel gorgeous. If you're however like me and have no idea how to paint something that gorgeous, you may wanna look at different barrels and see one that you find aesthetically pleasing or maybe get one that has a planter on the lid that you can plant a plant in, which we're gonna see in the next picture. And you also wanna think about cost. We have this wonderful rebate program. It's gonna give you back some of your money for purchasing these systems and you wanna get the most bang for your buck. So doing a little bit of research and finding the right system for you that gets all these check marks is going to make you happy in the long run. So we talked a little bit about rain barrels and I mentioned the word cistern a couple times. So a cistern is when you have over 200 gallons in a single tank. But some people may be really intimidated by having a huge tank in their yard. So there are other ways to get larger capacity systems. So cistern size capacity systems while using smaller tanks. So on the left here, you can see at Tierra Linda Middle School in San Carlos, we put two 50 gallon tanks together and they're daisy chained on the bottom. You can see that pipe running across the bottom, connecting them. And that means that when all the water flows into our first tank here, the water goes down into the tank and it goes through this pipe and both tanks fill simultaneously. And water seeks its own level, so that's gonna work. Even if like in this other system on the right, your tank is six inches underneath your, your sorry, your uh, pipe is six inches underneath your tank. Water seeks its own level, so it's going to come in that first tank and it's going to fill that pipe and then all of four of those barrels in the right hand picture are going to fill simultaneously. Only because we have a way for air to escape at the top, so that's important. If you don't have a way for the air to escape, especially in the, the three other tanks in the back, um, they're not going to fill up because the air pressure is going to push the water back. We don't need a valve to let air escape on this one on the Tierra Linda image, because as you can see, we actually have plants growing in the lid. And so the air is able to escape up through the soil and out the lid in that case, because it's the way the system is designed. Um, this allows you to have a larger system. It's easy to add on to. So if you wanna start with one or two barrels and then you're like, you know, I'd like to have my rainwater last a little longer into the summer. You can very easily add onto this system. Um, you get a little bit better pressure for watering just because you have a higher number of gallons of water in the tank. This is also a great way to bridge the gap from your downspout to your garden. So if your downspout, you have no downspout on the west side of your house whatsoever, but that's where your garden is, you can run barrels along the wall and around the corner. You know, there's a way to, to use the barrels to bridge that gap. Um, please ignore the last dot for San Mateo County, the 200 gallons qualify um, for a top tier rebate and Alameda County, I'm not um, 
I believe you're still at the uh, 50 gallons per barrel um, with that. But you can also check on the Basco website and see if you might be able to qualify for a different rebate with a larger system. So let's talk a little bit about accessories. We do have some questions about some of the accessories already. So I'm going to move forward and talk about accessories. And then we'll talk about maintenance and cleaning the systems. Um, so we already talked a little bit about the leaf eater. And the leaf eater does exactly what you would think it does. It keeps the leaves out of your system. They're slanted, so the leaves want to fall off the front. Most tanks that are built to be a rain barrel tank will already have screening and you would put this above that screening. But if you are doing a blue barrel or a different tank, this can act as your required screening as long as it's a fully closed system underneath this point. So there's no way for mosquitoes to get into the system underneath the screening. They're very easy to clean. This part right here on top, there's, you can, it's kind of a dark picture, but there's a little tab there that you can lift up and the whole screen lifts out and it's just super easy to clean. Um, different systems cost different amounts. You can get them at your local hardware store sometimes or more often by ordering online. Um, first flush diverters. So there's actually a lot of debate among professionals as to whether or not a first flush diverter is worth installing. Um, these are how, this is how I make my decision whether or not I'm going to install a first flush diverter. So if I'm installing at a site where the homeowner or the business owner is able to maintain and clean the diverter, because it does need to be cleaned more often than the tank. Um, if I'm in a very high particular area near a highway, near a farm, near something else that produces a lot of dust like a quarry, um, and I'm worried about those extra particulates in my system because I'm using drip irrigation or something that I don't want those fine particulates in my system. These are all reasons to use a first flush diverter. If you're not going to be able to maintain it, if you don't care if there's particulates because you're going to water everything with a watering can anyway, or if it's a very low dust area and there isn't a lot of overgrowth and you're just not you don't think you have a lot of dust on your roof, then you may not need a first flush diverter. So let's talk about how they work. So your water flows, oops, green on green is not gonna work. So let's go to the side. Your water flows from your gutter system down into this first flush system. And as this fills up, this ball floats and it will float up until it is right here up against a little gasket and it will seal. And that will trap that first flush of the dirtiest, nastiest water that was on your roof. All that dirt and everything else that got picked up with that first bit of rain will get trapped underneath the ball in the system. So you'll have all those horrible particulates down here in the bottom and all the murky water on top of it and the ball sealing your system. So once that seals and all the rest of the water won't be able to go down into there, so it'll flow over to your rain barrel tank. At the bottom, there is a slow, slow, slow drip gauge. So it's going to just drip, drip, drip a couple drops a minute and slowly drain out this first flush system, taking all that dirty water and capturing all that dirt. And then the next drain, it'll fill up again with the first flush of the next drain. The issue there is if you don't clean it out, when the next drain hits it, it's going to pick up all the other dirt that was in there from the previous rains, and your water, it's going to get dirtier and dirtier, and eventually it's going to clog that whole filter and it's not going to drain anymore. And then it's going to sit there dirty and filled with water and no longer do its job because it will be filled and it won't be able to capture that first flush. So it does need to be cleaned regularly. Um, it's completely optional and is very effective at some places. This picture on the left-hand side is at the Peninsula Conservation Center in Palo Alto. They have a very small first flush diverter system that's about four feet and that is the a system that's running into 
two separate drip irrigation systems and it's right next to highway 101 so it absolutely is high particulates it it it's using drip irrigation it hits all those check marks so it has a first flush diverter um so we talked a little bit also about depth gauges so these are great if you have young kids or you know young kids that come over to hang out grandkids or if you're in my case i've installed some of these at preschools because the kids love to go out and see how much water's in the tank and they'll come in the next day and even though it didn't rain overnight they'll go running over and see if there's more water it's also really nice if you travel a lot because you can get ones like this bottom left picture that have a remote gauge reading that you can put you know I've, i know someone who puts it in their kitchen and they have you know a ring camera on it and when it drops below 15 percent, they have a neighbor come over and fill up their tank because they don't have any they're not hooked up to any municipal water so they just add water to the tank throughout the summer to be able to finish their watering and there are ways to do makeup water like that um but it's it's a nice easy way to see how much is in your tank but you can also take your hand and just slap the side of the tank and work your way from the bottom up and when it stops sounding like a solid thunk and starts sounding hollow that's the depth your water is at so it's a you know very easy to just go out and physically check your tank if you're able to um the other nice time to have especially the remote reader is for tanks that are underground or um harder to access but for a tank that's easily exposed in a non-permitted tank this is this is maybe an accessory you don't need um completely optional um we also talked a little bit about pumps so if you want to get your water farther or move it uphill or have just a little bit more water pressure when you're watering you may want a pump you can get on-demand pumps from the 80 dollar to 150 dollar range um just like anything designer shoes, you can also spend three times that amount on a pump. Probably don't need to though. 80 to 150 is gonna get you a, a very good um, usable pump. Um, you can get them to attach directly to the barrel and the hose, simple, easy setup, add pressure to the system. The really big caveat here is if you want to use a pump and leave it plugged in all the time so it's hooked up to a power supply, you need a permit. If you are just going to use the pump when you're actively watering and it's not being left out there, it's not being left hooked up, you don't need a permit. But if you're leaving it actively hooked into the system, you do need a permit. And we're going to talk a little bit about permits later on. But before I get there, I want to talk about some roof types. So everyone always asks me, I have this roof, I have that roof, can I ra harvest rainwater? And in general, yes, you can harvest rainwater from almost any roof type. If you have a galvanized roof, asbestos, copper, lead, or treated wood, then you can't. And these should be really obvious um, reasons why not. You're gonna, you, these are things that you don't want in your water system, right? The galvanized is gonna leach zinc, the asbestos is gonna leak leach asbestos, um, you just don't want the copper oxide or the lead oxide or the, the herbicides or the pesticides that are in the treated wood. So none of that is going to give you a healthy garden. So we don't want that water going onto our garden. So we're not gonna capture that water. As you can see from this picture on the bottom right, you know, you see a rusty, rusty reef. You, you really don't want that going on your plants. Um, other types of metal such as standing seam metal or non-galvanized corrugated metal are actually the most efficient you can use. They're great, it's very clean, um, great for landscape irrigation and safe for root vegetables. Same thing with concrete or clay tiles. Um, when you get into wood or cedar shakes or shingles or asphalt shingles, um, you need to talk to the manufacturer and find out because most asphalt shingles are totally inert but sometimes they'll use a different type of glue that may have something in it. You can get these tested um, if you are concerned, but you can talk to your manufacturer. 
with woods and cedar shingles, um, you want to just know, know what's on your roof. If you're paying someone to go on your roof and treat your shingles with an herbicide once a year, you probably don't want that herbicide on your plants. So you'll know if you're treating your roof regularly. Um, if it's a brand new asphalt roof, you don't want to capture the water for the cu first couple of rainfalls because you are going to get a lot of those asphalt pebbles coming out. Um, so when in doubt, collect a sample and send it in to know what you're up against. There are rooftop coatings that you can get to make rainwater harvesting possible, even with an otherwise unsuitable material. Um, the other question I often get is solar panels. Uh, solar panels are usually great. They're gonna be very efficient and the water's gonna run right off of them and into your tank and that that's clean. Um, you can test any adhesives if they're on there with an adhesive, but if they're a raised panel, they're gonna be they're gonna be clean. Uh, so overall, most roofs are gonna be fine and you probably know if you have one of the roofs that are not suitable. Um, but when in doubt, you can have it tested. Okay, do I need a permit? This is, you know, the big question. If you are plumbing fully exterior to a single family home and doing a system that's under 360 gallons, you're all set, no permit needed. You do need to follow the rules that we talked about, right? You need to have that screening you need to put a sign on it like the one on this screen that says caution non potable water do not drink. And you need to make sure you're maintaining your barrels appropriately, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. If you really, really want to go big with your system and you're not connecting it to electrical and you're not connecting it directly to a makeup water supply. This doesn't mean you can't hold a hose over it to add water at some point. This means that you're not physically connecting it to municipal water. Then you can go up to 5,000 gallons with drip irrigation only. So if you go up to 365 gallons, you can no longer water with a hose or a watering can. You have to have the system connected to a drip irrigation system and it needs to be connected with no electrical. So that means you're using a basic battery up powered timer, you're not connecting a pump. There's nothing connected to make up water supply. It's a very simple system. With that much water though, you're gonna have a lot of water pressure because the weight of the water and the weight of gravity is going to add a lot more to it. Um, if you do not meet those above exemptions or you want a below ground system or a stack system above ground, you wanna stack your barrels on top of each other, or if you want to connect to interior plumbing, such as using them to flush toilets, all of these are things that do require a permit. Um, if you want to use this water for potable use, it does need to be treated and you would need a permit to do that as well. So we are talking for all this presentation about these smaller systems on a single family home that are just for landscape irrigation. Um, let's talk a little bit about maintenance and keeping your tanks clean. So any tank that is designed to be a rain barrel is going to be UV resistant and sealed. So that means you're not gonna have algae growing or any other issues with stuff growing inside your tank. You will get a clean bio slime on the inside of the tank, but it won't be an algae growing or anything that's harmful to your plants. This is why it's very important to use systems that are designed to be a rain barrel. It is illegal in the state of California to take a garbage can and call it a rain barrel. And that is for multiple reasons. It's very hard to screen it. Garbage cans aren't made for the pressure of the water. So eventually they will burst um, fairly violently. Um, and a lot of times they aren't UV resistant. And we, it's really important to use tanks that are designed for this because they will be UV resistant. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you'll find systems where people took IBC totes or other things and turned them into rain barrels and they painted them and they added layers and layers of paint to create that UV resistance. And that can be done, but you're not going to get a rebate. And 
you know, may have to deal with permitting in the state of California. So use systems that are designed to be a rain barrel or use systems like blue barrel that are food grade UV resistant barrels designed for this and have, have a reuse purpose. Um, so let's talk about the other maintenance that you do need to do. You gotta clean your gutters at least twice a year. You don't want your gutters to look like this picture on the top. Um, when I went to install the tanks at Gamble Garden, I got up there and their gutters looked exactly like this. And I have no idea when they were done last, but they were growing trees out of them. And that is dangerous because you're getting a lot of weight in your gutters and your gutters could rip off the house and do damage to the house. So you wanna keep your gutters clean anyway. But if you have a rainwatering system, you are required by the state to clean your gutters twice a year. And that's just to help protect your system so you don't have funky, you know, molds or moss or anything growing in your gutter that's going to end up in your tank. Check and empty your leaf feeder at least four times a year. So we're looking at, you know, any any of our um, our leaf feeder, our screening, whatever our screens are on there. We want to check that. Um, if you have a first slush diverter, minimally twice a year. Uh, but realistically, you really need to clean that after every storm because it's going to get pretty grungy every single storm. Um, visually inspect your valves and components. So this means at least once a year, the state of California wants you to walk on over and take a look at your system. If it's installed on your house, you're probably walking by it more than once a year, I hope, and you're able to do this far more often. So probably at least once a month, you're taking a look at it and just checking that the valves are still working and nothing's missing, your screening's still installed, all the components that you're supposed to have are there and you know you didn't have a squirrel come along and chew off the ball valve or something totally insane. Everything's still installed. Um, you know, every five years or so, you do wanna drain out the system, make sure you use all that harvested water and then just run a hose through it, flush out the barrel, rinse it. Um, this will just give you a chance to get any built up debris off the bottom of the barrel and, and flush it out. So you would disconnect the outflow of your barrel once it's totally empty and just get in there with a hose. Very easy to do. Um, and you can do that every five years. You can store your water for quite a long time um, because this is just rainwater. So we're only talking about water that falls from the sky, hits our roofs, comes down our, our indoor gutters and down our downspouts into these tanks. So this water is can be stored and, and you're okay to store it. But you know, we should use it because the more you store it, the less you're collecting. So use your water regularly. Empty your barrels between storm events. Uh, you know, if if you're watching the news and they say, you know, we're going to get a big storm next week, try to use your water as much as you can before the storm so that you can refill that tank and capture more water. And that way that water before this rain event, all the water in your tank is getting absorbed into the ground. And then you're keeping whatever size your tank system is from going into that first flush and going into that that storm runoff that we were talking about in the beginning. So that will help decrease the pollution in our system. Um, you know, we talked about ways to use your water and it's a great, great for washing tools or irrigating with and just trying to get it in the soil. And if you do wanna connect it to a toilet for flushing, you do need a permit, but there are ways to make that happen so that you can use rainwater. And there are some really cool examples. Some of the stores at Stanford Shopping Center have, have that set up and you'll see signs that said, you know, reclaimed water being used for flushing toilets. So you will, you can see that in some more um, larger scale applications as well. Uh, we're gonna take a look at where you can buy a rain barrel really quickly. And then we're gonna talk about some resources. Um, and then we will go on to the Q and A. Um, so where can I buy a rain barrel? So a basic kit, which comes with the barrel and everything you need to install it with very simple instructions, very easy to do it yourself. You can buy them online or you can go into a local hardware store and they will have to order them. Um, most of our local hardware stores don't keep them in stock, but they do have them in their system. 
So then you'll be able to order them and pick them up in a week or so. Um, so there, it, there is definitely a local option there. Food grade recycled barrels. I am a huge fan of food grade recycled barrels because food grade barrels can only be used once. So if you get a blue barrel shipped to, you know, this big distributor with some sort of food syrup, Coca-Cola syrup, or the green ones are used for olive oil, once they take that product out of the barrel, it can no longer be used for a food grade item again. It is served its purpose, it is done. FDA only approves one use. So at that point, this barrel needs to find a second life. And using it for rainwater harvesting is a great way to give it a second life. Um, they're usually 55 gallons. You can buy a, a kit online. If you search, you know, rain, rain barrel diverter kit, you'll get one um, that has the diverter that I showed you with the partial diverter. It has the flexi hose and it has all the instructions on how to drill into the barrel and create a system. So it's very easy to do. Um, you can also do wine barrels, which are not eligible for the rebate, unfortunately, but sometimes they're a little more attractive. I will be emailing you a DIY, um, how to convert wine barrels um, handout as part of the handouts we're gonna send, which we'll talk about more on the next slide. Um, but wine barrels are not covered by the rebate. Um, olive barrels and blue barrels, as long as they're installed correctly, are covered by the rebate. Um, Bluebarrelsystems.org, or sorry, bluebarrelsystems.com um, is a local uh, Santa Rosa company that has their own full system of how to install blue barrels. They'll connect you to a distributor to purchase the blue barrels and they will also sell you their full kit. And when you buy everything from them, they have dozens of online videos to walk you through step-by-step -step on how to install these by yourself to make it very easy. Um, cisterns, tanks that are over 200 gallons uh, generally are not able to be plumbed with a kit. So you're going to do a direct plumbing like we saw in that picture where um, that downspout's coming straight into the top of the tank. And then usually they're set up to, to run with a three inch overflow and a one inch output. And you can buy all of the supplies that you would need from a local hardware store to connect to that kit, to connect to a cistern. They're not gonna come with instructions. Um, so they, they may, might feel a little bit more intimidating. Uh, but there are live uh, workshops that you can come to to learn how to install them in person. And we do a few of those a year. Take a look on the Bosco website or the Flows to Bay website, and they'll show the upcoming ones. So there are ways to learn how to do that yourself in person. Um, Urban Farmer in San Francisco and San Lorenzo Lumber in Santa Cruz usually keep cisterns in stock. So you can give them a call and see what sizes they have in stock when you're looking. Um, it used to be that certain recycled barrels could be given away, um, you know, the food grade barrels. Unfortunately, now there really aren't any resources to find a used barrel for free. You are going to be buying even the recycled barrels. Um, buying just the barrels through Blue Barrel Systems, I believe they're $40 a barrel. And then the kits, I think, are about $25. So you end up at about $60 to $65 total for one blue barrel, which is mostly covered by the rebate. Um, so we do have some resources here. We're going to email these to you as well. So don't worry about trying to quickly write these all down. Um, we're going to send you this link. Um, there are some installers in the area. This is just kind of a start off um, list of installers that we know um, are doing, um, or I, I pulled this from the Flows to Bay website. So Flows to Bay believes they are still doing installations and this is what they're willing to do. Um, especially if you decide you wanna go all in with you know, a full rain barrel system, 
you know, with a full permitted system working with gray water landscaping or bay maples or one of these other ones may be the way to go because they have experience in designing systems that are large and automated. Um, most of the systems that I showed today are really easy to do DIY. So absolutely a wonderful way for you to just go home and, and be able to do this on your own. And like I said, there are in-person workshops that you can attend to try to learn this yourself a little bit better and, and be able to take those skills home with you. Um, so we're gonna take a, some time for some more questions. If you aren't comfortable typing your questions in, you can raise your hand on the bottom and we'll unmute you and you can ask me directly. And otherwise I'm gonna read out some questions as we go. And I'm just gonna put the rebate slide back up um, while we're talking about some questions. So we do have a question, return on investment. Um, so we did discuss, you know, the environmental impacts and how important it is to not have the pollution going into our creeks and how this really does make a huge difference with that. As far as the financial return on the investment, um, these barrels are not going to cost you much. The rebate covers a huge percentage of the cost. Um, so you may be paying 10 to $15 out of hand. So you guys would have to look at your own water bill and figure out exactly, you know, how long it's going to take you to save that 10 to $15. Um, so that's it, your return should be pretty quick though. Uh, and especially if you think about those huge numbers we were talking about where, let's see if I can get all the way back to the beginning when we were talking about, um, there we go. So especially when we're talking about, you know, the possibility of 13,000 gallons of water from, from a small roof that, you know, you, you really can capture a lot of water and, and keep 13,000 gallons worth of water from not carrying pollutants into our creeks and getting to our, to our water basin a little bit more slowly and more cleanly. Uh, collapsible rain barrels. So I have a question here. If collapsible rain barrel portable water storage tanks qualify for the rebate, collapsible rain barrels do not qualify for the rebate. Um, sorry. <laughs> so uh, you do need you need do need to have an actual tank um, that is a, a fully installed and and going to stay in place tank. And the class ones don't qualify. I believe that the county um, or the the district, Bosco district, had has had some issues um, with those in the past, and they no longer qualify. Um, so I have a question here: How much is the total professional cost of installing a basic system without options? So if you're installing a 55 gallon system on your own, doing it DIY because they're very simple and they come with all the instructions and you take the $50 rebate, you're looking at 10 to $15 out of pocket. Um, as far as if you wanted to hire one of those companies to do it for you, I have no idea. Um, I don't know what they charge hourly and I, I do not know what they would charge for a very small, simple system. But that's okay because you guys now know the main main things you need to have with the screening and the labeling and what the maintenance is required so you guys can go home and install these all on your own you, you don't need to worry about hiring an installer So I think we have time for a couple more questions if we have any more. Giselle, do you have anything you'd like to add from, from the county? 
program. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to you, uh, Chris, for uh, spending your evening with us and sharing all this great knowledge. Um, I'm sure everyone here learned something new and, and has some great takeaways. Um, and as Chris mentioned, we'll be emailing out um, those resources that she had on the previous slide as well. So you can take a look at those and uh, reach out if you have any like follow-up questions as well. Um, But yeah, you know, this is a great way, uh, innovative way to, you know, try to conserve water and highly encourage anyone who wants to pursue installing a rain barrel to definitely um, apply for a rebate since that is um, a resource that we have as well. Um, All right, any last minute questions, type it in while you can. But if something just, comes up later, as always, you know, you can reach out um, to our uh, water use efficiency team. I'll type in the email in the chat. So, and I just want to reiterate that I know this was a lot of information tonight. I was asked to kind of give a high level overview of everything. When you're going to do a system DIY or a more professional system, you are not going to need everything I talked about tonight. These are just so that you have, you know, the basics and then you can, the DIY kits are very straightforward. Or if you are going the professional route, they're going to talk you through everything as well. So this is just to give you an idea and get you in there. I think we had a hand up. Oh, maybe not. There we go. Oh. I keep seeing a hand up and then I don't see it. So someone's playing with me. <laughs> okay. So I have a question from Butch. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, I wasn't playing with you. I was just trying to figure out where to leave that. I just wanted to ask if there was any uh, pamphlets or books uh, that would be available with this type of information. I'm sure they're out there. I don't know of any good um, hard copy resources. We are gonna email you some wonderful websites that have great resources and links to other resources. And there's gonna be so much information if you follow the links down the rabbit holes that it'll be almost as good as a book, uh, but it is all gonna be digital. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. You're very welcome. Good job. All right, well, I think if we don't have any more questions, we can go ahead and conclude this evening's workshop. Um, thanks again to everyone for joining us. Thank you to Chris for that wonderful presentation. Um, I hope everyone um, found this information helpful and informative and um, we will, as mentioned, let you know um, once the recording is available, we post it to our ACWD website um, and we'll follow up with the resources. And as always, um, our water use efficiency team at ACWD is available for your questions um, or comments or anything related to our conservation programs and resources. Happy to help. Um, 
yeah, give us a call, email us, um, and we'll get back to you. Um, but yeah, no more questions. So I think we can go ahead and, and conclude this workshop. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining and have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Have a nice night. All right, bye.